Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for joining us. I am going to stop sharing my screen here and give me just a moment. And okay, and I won't. Will I spotlight myself briefly? I'll try to do that. Thank you for your patience while I try to do this. I don't. I don't see a way to spotlight myself. So um, anyway, I'll just. I'll just start uh, with myself up in the. Uh, corner of the screen. Thanks everybody for coming uh, to our first of two Distinguished Faculty Award lectures. Uh, this is um, uh, our fall presentation uh, with Javier Gago, Professor of uh, Biology. Uh, he is one of a few facts about uh, Dr. Gago. He is one of the uh, academic co-directors of the Baja California Field Studies Program here at GCC. He's a research associate in ichthyology at the Natural History Museum, of LA County. He has a PhD and an MS in biology from the University of Southern California. Marine biologist with a research focus in ichthyology and the evolution of deep sea fish. A research associate at the Natural History Museum of LA. Uh, you enjoy mentoring your students as they participate in research inter internships in the different collections at the museum. Loves to teach science and in particular, in, in particular our understanding of biodiversity. Um, and for the past 24 years, he has been lucky to teach classes at GCC's field station where our students can explore several ecosystems uh, in one of the most biodiverse localities on earth the beautiful Gulf of Mexico, Gulf of California in Mexico. A few fun facts uh, uh, that uh, Javier shared with me. He was born in Spain uh, and spent many years uh, in Ven Venezuela as a young man and was able to explore nature there uh, in many different ways, the rainforest, coral reefs. Uh, his parents were very supportive of his passions, uh, which helped him develop a love for science and become who he is today. And he also, uh, he arrived in the U.S. when he was 19 as an F-1 visa student and worked his way all the way through uh, to uh, obtaining a Ph.D. in biology at USC, which was a life-changing experience. And he just uh, wanted to uh, finish up by uh, saying how much he loves his wife and uh, um, uh, who is also a biologist and ex educator and, and uh, also um, uh, wanted to thank his kids uh, who are uh, caring human beings, but also uh, uh, academics in their own right. One is a PhD in public health and the other uh, has a BS or in uh, ecology, uh, finishing a BS in ecology and evolutionary biology at UC Davis. And he's very proud of them. Uh, so finally, I'd just like to say, uh, please hold your questions till uh, Javier says it's okay. Uh, and I, just finally, I'd like to say this is a really important award. Uh, there are all kinds of things that we do here. Um, if we think about completions, uh, we think about uh, all these institutional concerns, but really we are instructors and this is the award for instruction and passion around subject matter. Sorry if I'm talking too fast. Uh, anyway, I am going to leave it there uh, for you, Javier. Thank you for giving this lecture and have a great time. And thanks everybody for coming. Well, thank you, Roger, uh, for the kind introduction. Let me see if I can get this started. Hopefully this is the, only the first DFA Zoom lecture and the last one that you have to see. So hopefully it'll work well. Let me, let me see if I can do this. So give me a couple of seconds to share my screen and get things going here. So I think you can probably all see my screen right now. Yes, you're good. Very good, thank you. Okay, so it didn't take me long really to come up with a subject for biodiversity because like Roger said, I've always been in love with nature and species since I was a little kid. And I think all of you probably understand the concept of biophilia really well, because 
I think we all have from when, since we we're kids, these, this tendency that I think is innate to towards other species and other life processes. And so what I wanna do today, I'm gonna focus on biodiversity by trying to tell you a few of the fundamental concepts that are important in biodiversity by using examples of how our students here at Glendale College to study biodiversity but also focusing on two programs that we have at Glendale College, the Baja California Field Studies Program, and you can see some photographs here from students and faculty in Baja. But I also wanna focus on a program that we have with the Natural History Museum, where our students get to go and do research with the curators of the collections at the museum. And the program is so successful that some students have already published papers before they even graduate with a two-year degree in a community college. But to start with, I'm going to argue that variation is probably the most fundamental property of life. Life is variable. And in biology, without a doubt, we think that the variation that is most important to us is gonna be the variation that is due to mutations, changes in the genetic material, and the one that is heritable. And, and that the reason for that is that heritable variation is the one that through processes like natural selection, genetic drift and gene flow can lead to the formation of new species, what we biologists call speciation. Now we can measure biodiversity at many different levels, uh, all the way from molecular level um, to ecosystem level, for example. This is a student at the Natural History Museum extracting DNA from snails, but most of the time we focus at the species level. And if you compare these two communities on the left-hand side, A and B, you'll notice that both of them have what we call the same species richness. They both have the same number of species, three species of trees. But the one on the bottom is different in evenness than the one on the top, because the one on the bottom is dominated by one particular species. So there's many different ways to measure biodiversity. It actually gets complicated because there are multiple mathematical algorithms to try to look at biodiversity. But most of the time, again, we're counting species. So I think it's important for all of us to understand what does a biologist mean by a species? Well, the problem is that because there are many ways to study biodiversity, there are equally many different species concepts. I think most biologists will agree that there has to be a natural unit in nature called a species. Let's think of it as the phylogenetic species concept or the evolutionary species concept. Think of it as an evolutionary lineage that is isolated through time from other lineages and that can be identified by specific traits, whether there are molecular traits or anatomical traits or behavioral traits. Let me give you an example. Until fairly recently, it was thought that there were only two living species of elephants, the Asian elephant and the African elephant. But new evidence from genetic sequences, from DNA sequences clearly shows that there are two separate lineages, evolutionary lineages of African elephants, the African savanna elephant and the African forest elephant. So right now, if you talk to a biologist, they'll tell you, no, there are three living species of elephants today. But most of the time, when we go in the field, even though now we do have the technology to look at DNA sequences from fragments of DNA just in water in the ocean, for example, most of the time when we're talking about animals or plants or larger organisms, we use what we call the morphospecies concept. We look for anatomical differences. So let me give you two examples from research at the Natural History Museum by our students. In 2005, Richard Record, who was a student here at Glendale College, and I published a paper describing a new species of lanternfish. This is the new species of lanternfish. Now, lanternfishes are really interesting because they're supposed to be one of the most abundant vertebrates in the planet. They're also one of the most common animals in these migration that happens in the deep sea from about 1500 meters to the surface and down every day. This is supposed to be the largest migration of animals in the planet. And to identify these new species, we used anatomical traits. For example, these animals produce light, they're bioluminescent. So they have these organs that you see along the belly and on the side called photophores, but they're also sexually dimorphic. The males and the females look different from each other. 
for example, males have these luminescent organs on the top right here. The females won't have that. And one of the many traits that my student and I used to identify these as a new species was the difference in the shape of these organs. They happen to be called the supracaudal glands between these species and the closest relative that lives on this side of the Pacific, on the Eastern Pacific. Some of our students do similar things at the museum. Amir Ahumairi was a student at the museum that worked with forehead flies. Now, forehead flies are really interesting. They're also called the humpback flies. They're extremely diverse. There are about 4,000 known species of, flore, of, of forehead flies. He extracted or attempted to extract DNA from them using a new technique. But one of the things he was able to do is he was able to take this microscope right here, very expensive machine that takes these absolutely beautiful images of these animals under the microscope that are in perfect focus three-dimensionally. These are very small flies. They're less than a millimeter, most of them in size. So he was looking for anatomical differences that help to understand you know, these animals in nature. Now, most of the time, and I apologize for the phone in the background, that's the great thing about uh, you know, teaching through Zoom. Most of the time with the students, we talk about what is called the biological species concept. Here's what it is. Two popula po I mean, populations or individuals that are capable of interbreeding with each other and produce viable fertile offspring should be considered the same species. So let's take a simple example. The bluefin tuna in the Atlantic and the bluefin tuna in the Pacific are considered to be different species, but they look really similar. If I was to bring these fishes to you and you look at them, you would have a hard time telling them apart. So why is it that biologists think that these two, these two animals are different species? Well, the question you would have to ask yourself is, well, can they mate? Is there evidence that they can mate and produce viable and fertile offspring? And the answer is no, as far as we know, there's absolutely no evidence that the Atlantic bluefin tuna and the Pacific bluefin tuna could potentially mate with each other and produce fertile of springs. And it's not just because they are isolated by geography, by the way. By the way, interesting fact, the Pacific bluefin tuna holds the record for the most expensive fish ever sold in the planet. One specimen in 2019 sold for $3.1 million in Tokyo, okay? Think about that because at the end we'll talk about some of the, threat, the threats to biodiversity. The problem with this concept though is that it does not apply to asexual organisms, which are the majority of the diversity on earth, bacteria. This is a great example of a bacterium that was discovered recently living in sea ice in the Arctic at sub-freezing temperatures. You can't apply this concept to them because they don't reproduce sexually. And then there are some problems because in plants particularly, but also in animals sometimes, there are natural hybrids. What do I mean by that? two species that can actually mate and produce offspring that are viable and fertile. For example, the prairie sunflower and the common sunflower that are different species are known to multiple times hybridize and produce a fertile offspring that is considered a different species and survives in a very unique environment, sand dunes. And of course, what do you do with fossils? They're dead, long dead, millions of years. You can't test for sexual reproduction, right? Reproductive isolation. Well, another study that I did with a student at the museum and with a paleontologist by the name of J.D. Stewart was describing this fossil, which is very unique. This is a cutlass fish, it's a deep sea fish. This fossil is supposed to be the only one of this particular group of fishes on the Western side of North America. It's somewhere between 9.5 to 11 point something million years old. It was collected in Lompoc, just north of Santa Barbara in a geological formation called the Monterey Formation. So the student, the paleontologist, myself, we looked at anatomical traits to try to identify it as a different species and compare it 
with what we think are the closest relatives living today. To do that, some of our students like Alvaro de la Cruz had to learn how to do x-rays. This is Rick Finney, who was the collections manager in ichthyology at the museum, teaching him how to do x-rays. Rick was an amazing person, an amazing person to work with. Every Friday, he would drop everything he would do to help our students. Unfortunately, Rick passed away a few months ago, so he's in our memory, but what a great person for the students, what a great resource for our students at the Natural History Museum. I mean, he was. And one of the things we did, well, mostly really was her that did it. I mean, she actually was able to do what? She was able to take a humongous database of morphometric characters. These were characters of shape. And then she used two statistical analysis, a principal component analysis, which is a multivariate analysis that looks at shape among many different parameters at the same time, and a regression analysis. And I won't go over the details of this, except to show you that the X in both of these graphs represents the fossil. And then the blue and red lines, or the blue and red lines represent 95% confidence intervals. So these data set shows us that the shape of this fossil is statistically different from the species that are alive today. And this was one of the traits that we used to identify it as a new species. But the paleontologist at the museum warned us, this is Dr. J.D. Stewart, he warned us, he says, well, be careful because some of that shape differences may be because of effects of compression during fossilization. And he remember that there was a, uh, a, a rock from the same location with a different species. This happens to be kind of like a species of a stink, uh, stink sardine where there were five specimens. You can see them right here, except that three of the specimens are laid out this way and two of them are laid out this way. So they got compressed through time in different axes. Three of them were compressed dorsoventrally and two of them were compressed from an anterior to a posterior axis. So as a scientist, um, we have to be really careful and we have to make sure that we understand where the failures in our data may be. We still think that the shape was different, but we need to be aware of that. So how many species are there living on earth today? The answer is we don't know. And that may be surprising to you because we've been studying a species forever. I mean, I mean, you don't have to be a scientist to try to classify organisms as you see them in nature. Uh, most of the papers you read would say 1.5 to 1.9 million living species, but it can go as many as 6 billion species. Uh, more at all said 8.7 plus 1.3 plus or minus 1.3 million eukaryotic species. That does not include bacteria and archaea. Okay, which are very important because Larson et al. said 90% of all the species may be bacteria. And we don't know how many there are. Most of them are impossible to culture in the lab. Just insects, think about that, 40 million. And also think about the fact that every time you discover a new species, there are other species that are living symbiotically with that species that also may be new to science. And I also want you to consider the fact that the largest environment on earth by far, 95% of the volume of the sphere of the earth that contains life is the deep sea in complete darkness, okay? It's the most unknown environment on earth. And we know very little about what the biodiversity of the deep sea is. Just a recent study and just looking at animals, not even bacteria, they took about 350,000 different photographs of animals in the deep sea and only one out of five was known to science. So we don't know really what the actual number is. It may be possibly be in the billions. So when we look at all these species, can we put these species in some type of organizational pattern? For a long time, it was thought that a species could be organized from simple to complex. For example, plants are more simple than animals and within animals, humans are more complex. And you could even put you know, supernatural beings like angels or angels and gods. So this concept was called the scala nature or the great chain of being. 
Is that true? Well, as much as I like this cartoon, because I think at least culturally humans are doing some things that are making us look like we're regressing on the way we do things. This idea of a linear progression from simple to complex is absolutely not true. Let's take an example. Parasites were considered for a long time to be degenerate, primitive, simple. Let's take a great example of parasites that our students study here in our classes, our majors class in biology. The classes stowed are the tapeworms. There's more than 6,000 different species of tapeworms. They're all parasites of vertebrates, including humans. This is a picture from one of our students of what it looks like the head of the parasite, except that it's not a head. It's a specialized, very derived organ for attachment to your intestines. It's called the scolex. So is it really simple? I would argue not. Well, they have no digestive or circulatory system. Are they simple? I would argue not. They don't need them because the flat surface means more efficient exchange of nutrients. In fact, they have a really unique epidermal layer called the syncytial neodermis that allows them to absorb nutrients more efficiently than you and I would across our cells. And it allows them to prevent some toxins from coming into their body. And in fact, Beyond excolix, which is the attachment organ that I just mentioned, that's not the head, it's just an attachment organ. There are these series of segments behind it that are called the proglottids. And those proglottids are nothing else but really specialized, advanced reproductive systems. Each of them are hermaphroditic. They can self-fertilize with another proglottid in the same worm or with another worm. They can produce 700,000 eggs per day the proglottids can separate, they can move out with your fecal matter, they can crawl out of your anus. I would argue they're not primitive at all. And in fact, most parasites today, most biologists today think parasites is one of the most abundant lifestyles in animals. And more importantly, parasites appear to control the behavior of their host. They have evolved mechanisms to control their host. This is a stickleback fish that was infected with tapeworms. This is tickleback when it's infected with tapeworms will lose the fear of the predators, will swim to the surface, swim around the surface, their body color will change so that the predator has an easier time eating it in favor of the parasite so that the cycle can be completed. So I'm gonna argue here that parasites may be what we biologists call keystone species, very important at the ecological level. In fact, we know that degraded environments tend to have less parasitic species. And this is gonna surprise you. In an ecological study of a salt marsh in Carpinteria, the town that is just north of us here in the coast of California, the blue lines represent regular trophic or feeding interactions, non-parasitic. The red ones represent parasitic interactions. 75% of the links in food webs may be parasitic. And so I think you all know who Rachel Carson was, a really famous biologist and an excellent writer. Some people consider her to be the mother of environmental biology. She brought up to the public this idea of biomagnification, which plays into biodiversity. When a chemical enters a community of a species, it has the potential of increasing in concentrations as it goes from one feeding level to the next. And typically, top predators tend to have the highest concentration of chemicals, which may be harmful to humans. Well, what if we told you that parasites can actually potentially concentrate more of those than actually top predators like a great white shark potentially could? So this idea of linear progression from simple to complex, I'm going to argue is wrong. Charles Darwin in 1837, in one of his famous transmutation notebooks had already come with what the evidence show is correct. In his book, he wrote, I think, and he drew a tree with branches with letters at the ends that represent the species. And in fact, in his most famous book on the origin of a species, there's only one diagram in that book and it's a tree. So today we build these trees, they're called phylogenetic trees, 
Think of it as a hypothesis of evolutionary relationships. These are built with complex mathematical algorithms and with data. This happens to be really complex because it's based on genomic DNA data. And this one is an interesting one because until really recently, we taught our students, hey, there is three groups of living things on earth. Bacteria, archaea, these things that look like bacteria but are not bacteria, and eukarya. But in 2015, scientists in the Arctic actually found sequences of DNA of these things called archaea that appear to be more closely related to us than the rest of the archaea. And recently in Japan, they were able to grow them in the lab. If that is true, and it appears like it's true, then there's only two groups of living things on earth, the bacteria and the archaea of which we, eukaryotes, are just a derived form of our care. Science changes as evidence changes. And these trees are really important outside just of basic biological science, applied science. SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the pandemic that we're all experiencing right now, this is a paper from this year, just a few months ago, that clearly shows using sequence data that the closest relative to the virus that is affecting us came from bats, most likely a zoonotic disease. And we can use these trees to identify relationships among living species, like the penguins that are alive today with extinct ones, and even better, we can now use something called the molecular clock to track down the points in time of these branches of the tree, the points of a speciation or formations of new species. So I guess I'm telling you that there is a historical, and by historical here, geological perspective to biodiversity. And I want you to realize that extinction is common. It is estimated that more than 98% of all the species that ever lived on earth are extinct. And some of our students have, are lucky enough to be able to work with amazing fossils at the museum. This is Sarah McDonald, who was working with the femur of a sauropod at the Dinosaur Institute. Vanessa Moll, who's now completing her PhD in cell and molecular biology, worked with insects from two formations, one in Germany called the Rod Formation and one in the US called the Green River Formation. So our students get the opportunity to actually work with these fossils of extinct organisms from millions of years ago. Here at Glendale College though, the majority of our students that take our majors classes, for example, they want to go into the health sciences. So it's not uncommon for them to say, why do I have to know about all these other species? I'm going to work with humans. You know, who cares? Why is that important for me? Well, I think most of us in biology would argue that probably the best strategy to understand function in anatomy and physiology is to, call, is to use what we call the comparative method. If you compare an organ or the physiology of an organ or a system to that of other species, you understand better how it works and the problems of that system. So let me give you one example. Let's compare lungs and gills. To understand how lungs and gills work, you need to understand a little bit of physics, fixed law. I won't go over the details, except that two of the important things that you need in order to exchange gases efficiently is the surface area, where the gases are going to be exchanged and the thickness of the membrane where the gases are going to be exchanged. Well, both lungs and gills solve the problem of the thickness of the membrane where oxygen, for example, and CO2 gets exchanged because they both have what we call simple squamous epithelium. Now, I, I usually use a pen on my iPad to do these drawings live, but today to save time, I did them ahead of time. I push my students to do drawings by hand because I think there's nothing better than that, especially in anatomy and physiology, to understand three-dimensional position and connections between processes in physiology. But the squamous simple, simple squamous epithelium, which is like the layer of tissue that you have in the alveoli of your lungs or in the gills, are really flat cells that look like scales. But let's talk a little bit more basic. What is the real difference between lungs and gills? Well, to increase the surface area, right? Because you want more surface area for exchange of gases, you could fold tissues. During development, tissues fold. You can think of this almost like developmental origami. Let's imagine you have an embryo that is a ball of cells, okay? 
you could fold that ball of cells inwards, we call that invaginations, or you can fold it outwards, we call those evaginations. That's your basic difference between lungs and gills. These are lungs, these are gills. Now you may think, so what? That explains why gills can work underwater, but not in air and vice versa. Why lungs cannot work very well in water, but work well in air. Let's take a look at it. This is one of the most beautiful fishes I know. It not only beautiful, but it swims as much as 70 miles per hour. Now, if that doesn't make your jaw drop, I fail as a teacher right here, because that's impressive, okay? That, imagine that, right? Water is more viscous and contains less oxygen than air. And that animal is swimming nearly 70 miles per hour. No wonder fishes are the most muscular animals on earth in terms of proportion of muscle per body weight. And that's why they're so important as a food source, as a source of protein to humans. Well, remember again, gills are evaginations or outwards folds of tissue. In order for gills to work well, these folds need to remain separate from each other. When you take them out of the water, they collapse and stick to each other by adhesion and cohesion. And so you lose a tremendous amount of surface area. So that means that gills can only work well in water because the water keeps the folds separate. But fishes do something else that is really unique. They move water in one direction and then they move the blood in the tissues in the opposite direction. These are the gills of the fish. You can see the blue lines represent the water, but notice that the blood in the tissues will go in the opposite direction. We call this counter current flow. And counter current flow makes the exchange of gases more efficient than if both fluids, the blood and the water were running in the same direction. And this is something that our students see over and over in different organ systems and in different species. This is an example of convergent evolution. One of our students, uh, Zach Edlinger at the museum, studied viper fish, which is a deep sea fish, compared it to a couple of ancestral species. He did a beautiful job of taking these fishes and making them transparent using an enzyme and then staining the bones and the cartilage of different colors to study the anatomy. Now, Zach was interested in the teeth in the gills. What? Teeth in the gills? Yeah, he wasn't surprised about that. He already knew that all the evidence point out that jaws have evolved from modified gills. So don't be surprised that there's teeth on the gills. But one cool thing that he noticed, and he did these beautiful micro dissections of the gills under the microscope, is that there are these really thin blue lines that you see right here. And these are nothing else but thin, uh, in pieces of cartilage that support that, stratif that, that simple squamous epithelium that I talked about, another way to keeping these folds separate from each other. Now, our students here at Glendale College, they dissect different animals, for example, a frog on the left-hand side and a pig right here on the right-hand side. Why is that important? Well, they get to understand the differences in the anatomy and why they matter. Let's take a look at it. Mammals are the only group of vertebrates that have a diaphragm, a muscle that helps you breathe. So when you breathe, inhalation is primarily by what? By negative pressure breathing. But in frogs, here's the lung of the frog, there is no diaphragm right there. So in order for them to inhale air, they have to push the air in with muscles in their mouth and in their throat. Completely different ways of ventilating their lungs. Now let's go as to what the problem with lungs in. Remember that lungs are in foldings of tissue, right? They're in vagination. So the problem with the lung is that lungs only work well if the fluid that carries oxygen is, it has a low viscosity like air. It's really difficult to move water in and out of the lungs because it's very viscous. And there is another problem, except for birds and fishes, in most vertebrates, the ventilation, the movement of air into your lungs is what we call tidal ventilation. You have to bring a volume of air with oxygen into your lungs. This is the lung right here. That's the trachea of the pig. And before you bring more air with oxygen in, you have to get rid of that volume. That is 
absolutely inefficient, especially compared to what fishes do, where the water is constantly flowing in one direction, not two directions. So where do lungs come from? That's the last part of it. Well, remember this little diagram I had right there that I told you, imagine a ball of cells. Well, that, has, that is actually one of the stages of development in embryology, even in humans. We call it the vlastula. It's a simple ball of cells with a center that is filled with fluid. Now, what happens during development, there's a picture of the vlastula. If you don't believe me that this is an embryonic stage, what happens is at some point, this is going to fold. Remember? And developmental origami. So it folds and it forms an opening called a blastopore. And how cool is that? That blastopore in humans, in vertebrates, and in sea stars becomes your anus. Your anus is the first opening to form in your body. And your digestive system is the first organ system to begin to form as an embryo. The mouth will form later. Now, why is this important? Well, our students now know that if you look at the body of an animal that has a digestive system like ours, your digestive system is nothing else but a tube that runs through another tube through your body. And if you look at a sea star, it's the same thing. This is an embryo of a sea star that our students look at in the, in the class. That's the anus, that's the mouth, that's the digestive system. So where do lungs come from? I don't think you're gonna be surprised to learn that lungs are also folds. Folds of what? folds of the anterior portion of your digestive system. That's how your lungs develop. When you are about five weeks old, right around the area of the embryo of the human where the pharynx is located, there's going to be a fold that begins to increase and keep folding and folding and folding inward, becoming your lungs. Why is this important? Because that creates problems. Right-hand side is a pig, left-hand side is a frog. When you look at that pattern of development, it means that the opening to your trachea is right next to the opening to your esophagus. Why is that a problem? Well, hopefully none of you had to deal with that, but that means, and this is a view, a sagittal section through a human cadaver, that sometimes the food is supposed to go this way, right, into the esophagus, but sometimes the food actually goes the wrong way and you can choke to death. This is because of what we call a developmental constraint, a physiological or anatomical problem that is nothing else but the result of a common developmental pattern that humans have with other vertebrates. Well, let's now look at uh, more direct evidence of biodiversity being important to humans. Mollusks, these are all pictures from Baja from our students. Uh, are one of the most diverse group of animals in the planet, octopuses, snails. Let's focus on gastropods, which are mollusks, and these are snails, for example. Uh, one of our students, uh, Raul Flamenco, who's now working on his PhD in marine toxicology, used the electron microscope to take photographs of this structure that you see in the background called a radula. A radula is nothing else but a belt with teeth that snails use for feeding. And there's quite a variation in the different types of raduli depending on the diet of the animal. He actually focused on these animal called a solar power sea slug, which is really cool because it steals chloroplasts from the algae that it eats to do photosynthesis for it, at least temporarily. But notice that the raduli is very different. It's a single row of teeth that folds upon itself. I want to focus on these group of snails called the cone snails, very diverse, recently evolved within the last 50 million years. And all of these snails, more than 800 species, feed on animals. They're carnivores. They don't eat algae. And they even feed on fish. The question to me is, how can they capture a fish? Aren't fish faster than these snails? They are. But what the snails have evolved, look at the video on the right-hand side, it's a radula that looks like a microscopic harpoon. So the snail approaches a sleeping fish and injects a neurotoxin into the fish that will paralyze the fish within seconds. The fish is not dead, it's just paralyzed. And it will swallow it and digest it alive. That's so cool. I mean, not from the perspective of the fish, of course, but very cool from the perspective of the snail. And the interesting thing in terms of the health sciences is that the number of possible neurotoxins in this group of snails is huge, potentially as many as 140,000 different kinds. And they are very specific. They act on these things called 
uh, membrane channels that control processes on cells. For example, the delta conotoxin causes paralysis by acting on a calcium channel in your neurons. So don't be surprised. The first synthetic form of a conotoxin that was extracted from these snails became a drug called Prialt, which is used as a painkiller. And Prialt is a thousand times more potent than morphine. So you can see the huge potential in pharmacology and in the health sciences to investigate organisms like this. Where do you find them? Well, here's part of the ecological problem. Most of the species of cone snails are found in Southeast Asia, tropical, subtropical areas, in mangrove forests and in coral reefs. So let me take you on a trip of Baja California where we take our students. I put these together to show you. We go to an area of the Gulf of California called the Midriff Islands. And within that area, we go to a specific location called Bahia de Los Angeles. We take the students to many islands, but we visit this island called Isla Coronado. And in the southern portion of that Isla Coronado, there is a mangrove forest. Now, mangrove forest, if you've been in the tropics, you know they are very common in the tropics. But this one is really unique. These are actual pictures from our students of that forest, because this is supposed to be the northernmost mangrove forest on this side of the Pacific Ocean. In other words, these organisms are at the very limit of the chemical and physical conditions that they require in order to survive. And the other important thing is that they're heavily impacted by human activities worldwide. These are really interesting organisms, by the way. They have prop roots that are out of the soil to extract oxygen because the soil has very low levels of oxygen. They're viviparous, which means that the fruits actually germinate, the seeds germinate before they drop from the parent plant. These are, again, pictures from my students and faculty from Baja. But the problem is we're losing mangrove forests at a very, very rapid rate. And it's especially from the most diverse environments in, in the marine environment, which is in the Indo-Pacific. And if you wonder, well, who cares about you know, a mangrove plant tree? Why does it matter? Well, studies have shown that these store, these turf mangrove ecosystems not only lose the mangrove plants, they lose a tremendous number of biomass of bacteria. And bacteria in these ecosystems is what helps to recycle all the nutrients that are necessary for all those species there to survive. Another environment that is in deep danger are coral reefs. Now our students don't get to see coral reefs in Baja where we go. They get to see a species of coral called the castle coral. These are pictures from our students that actually could form coral reefs, but it doesn't because it's beyond the physical limits where corals can survive. Now I wanna point out, notice that corals are animals and they look green because they have unicellular organisms living within them, we call them dinoflagellates, that actually do photosynthesis for them. Well, the problem is, and you've probably heard of this, we're losing coral reefs at a tremendous rate. There are some estimates out there from data that we may lose 90% of the coral reefs in the planet within the next two decades. Why is that? Well, ocean acidification is one, but the biggest one is ocean warming. Corals are very picky. If the chemical conditions of the water vary a little bit, they don't like it. They let go of that algae, that green unicellular organism out of their body. That's what we call coral bleaching and they die. And in fact, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration tracks these down. You can actually go to the web and create maps to show you, okay, what are the warning levels for coral bleaching around the planet? Yeah, doesn't look really good, does it? That's the most diverse environment for corals in the planet. Why is this? The data is clear. The overwhelming majority of scientists and the most respected scientific institutions in the world, the National Academies of Sciences, the Royal Society, they all tell you there is no doubt that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing rapidly. That means it's also increasing in the ocean. That's the green lines right there. Why? Because the ocean absorbs CO2. But the problem is that it's not just that, it's the warming of the earth, plus the fact that when CO2 gets in contact with water, it creates carbonic acid. 
So the pH of the water is decreasing. The oceans are becoming rapidly more acidic. Who cares about this, right? Well, I'm a marine biologist. I care about it. We have this thing in the oceans that is common called the oxygen minimum zone. It's in the deep sea, somewhere between 500 to 1500 meters down. That's common, but guess what? These oxygen minimum zones are getting larger, both vertically and horizontally across oceans. And that means that some environments like the oxygenated environments at the surface, uh, surface are getting compressed and the oxygen minimum zones are getting deeper, which means that animals that migrate, remember the lantern fish that I described with that student, they migrate through that. They're gonna have to spend more times migrating through these layers of low oxygen in the ocean. And if you take an oceanography class or you take my marine biology class, students learn that there's this thing called a conveyor belt that not only controls climate, this is the exchange of water from the surface to the deep sea in the oceans of the world, but is also responsible by bringing oxygen into the deep sea by sinking of water, like we call downwelling. When you warm the water, you're affecting that circulation of water around the planet. And if you think now, if you think that this is only happening in the open ocean, I warn you, it's not. Coastal areas are not free of this. For example, eutrophication, the addition of nutrients to environments by human activities have created gigantic dead zones where very few things can survive, especially at the mouths of rivers, like the mouth of the Mississippi River. Just in the US, there has been a 30 fold increase in eutrophication since the 1960s. And as oxygen goes down, the amount of organisms, the biomass decreases and the species numbers also decrease. And it's not local. It's not just the Gulf of Mexico in the coast of Texas and Louisiana. It's everywhere that you're seeing these eutrophication events becoming more and more common. So we need to think a little bit about extinction. And if you guys heard the news, New York Times yesterday, NPR today, um, Fish and Wildlife has just taken some species out of the Endangered Species Act because they're now considered to be extinct. What do we mean by mass extinctions? Where these two fellows at University of Chicago in 1982 for the first time showed that statistically there were five periods of time in the earth where there were these mass extinctions. Let's define a mass extinction as a period of less than 3 million years where you lose more than 75% of the species in the planet, more than three quarters of the species. There were five of them, the Ordovician, the Devonian, the Triassic, the most, the most known or the ones you hear the most about are the Permian because that one killed 95% of all the species in the planet. It kills so many, it's called the Great Dying. And of course, the most famous is the Cretaceous Paleogene 65 million years ago because it killed the dinosaurs. These are the dueling dinosaurs at the Natural History Museum where our students do research. So what were the causes of these extinctions? Well, certainly asteroids. I mean, there's plenty of evidence to show that one of the things that caused the extinction of dinosaurs was a massive asteroid that hit the Yucatan Peninsula about 65 million years ago. Active volcanism, yeah, massive volcanism uh, killed many species, but I want you to focus on the next three. Drastic temperature changes, uh, drastic sea level changes, anoxic events, events where the amount of oxygen in the oceans have decreased dramatically. Do these sound familiar to you? Do these sound like things that are potentially happening today? So don't be surprised. Many biologists believe we are in the, beginning or already in the middle of a sixth extinction. And this is likely underestimated by the way, because we don't know the catalog of all life in the planet. And there is no doubt that the causes are ecological stressors by humans, primarily direct killing like overfishing, habitat fragmentation, introduction of invasive species, and of course, climate change, both oceanic and atmospheric. This is a very, very cool, diagram from the 1600s island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. These are supposed to be Dutch colonists. That's a dodo bird. Keep the dodo bird in mind. So are we undergoing a mass extinction? Yeah, the evidence says we are. And I won't read this for you. You can read it as I talk. This is surprising. 75% of flying insects in German forests have disappeared in the last 25 years. Imagine what the consequences for plant communities that is. 
these frog in the background, the golden toad or toad, I should say. Last time we saw it, it was 1989 in Costa Rica. It's gone. You've probably heard of the passenger pigeon in the 1800s. There were descriptions. There were so many passenger pigeons that the sky would turn black, all gone. So this is an underestimate. We know that the rate of extinction currently is hundreds to thousands of times greater than the normal rate of background extinction. And most extinction is completely irreversible. Once you lose a species, it's gone. And the sad thing is most people are unaware of it. They don't know that this is happening. And this is happening in the oceans. I'm a marine biology. I can tell you the losses of tax in the oceans are huge. What does that matter? Well, we know that when biodiversity is lost, we, the environments have a harder time recovering from disturbances. It's more difficult to maintain water quality in the ocean and the capacity to produce food for humans also decreases. This is especially true for some groups Sharks and rays. Oh, but wait, sharks and rays, they're the bad guys, right? I mean, who cares about sharks and rays if they're the bad guys? Three quarters of the species of sharks and rays are considered to be in trouble because of overfishing. Unfortunately, or fortunately, our students in Baja get to see the good and the bad. These are pictures from Baja of very small sharks and rays that were haunted, the leftovers left behind, including females with ovaries. Those are ovaries. So are humans living a fingerprint on earth where we can call these the Anthropocene? I would claim yes. The scholars program students take my honors marine biology and they get to read a paper by Nielsen et al. that is really interesting. Because what Nielsen et al. did is they calculated the age of these fish called the Greenland shark. This is impressive. These animals appear to be able to get as, two, as, as old as 272 years old, as many as 392 years old. They're supposed to potentially be the oldest vertebrates in the planet. Now, how do they calculate this? Well, they looked at these things called crystalline eye proteins. They're in the lens of the eye, and they use carbon dating. But they have to calibrate their clock to be able to tell the age. Guess what they calibrated it with? isotopes from thermonuclear reactions of tests by humans in the Pacific Ocean from the 1950s and the 1960s. The humans are living a clear signature on Earth of an impact that is leading to the extinction of organisms. The last example I'm going to give you because before I talk a little bit about the Baja program and what the students do, the stellar sea cow is extinct this is related to manatees like the ones in Florida or the dugongs in, in the Indo-Pacific. They're extinct. They were supposed to be found all the way from Japan to California. They became extinct, we think, about 1768. Nobody can see them anymore. They were haunted for skin and fat, primarily by hunters from Russia, Canada, and the US. But guess what? It was a historical problem because now there's evidence that indigenous people in the Bering Sea were hunting sea otters. Sea otters eat sea urchins. When sea otter populations go down, sea urchin populations go up. Sea urchins eat kelp. If the sea urchin population goes up, the kelp goes down. These animals eat kelp, they starve. Does that sound familiar? I think most of you know that the same thing almost happened. The sea otters almost became extinct off our coasts of North America here. So is extinction irreversible? Will we be able to bring the passenger pigeon? This is a picture of Martha, the last passenger pigeon that died in 1914, or the dodo bird that is estimated the last one died in 1690. This is a specimen at the Oxford Museum. Will we be uh, able to tiger. bring the silent thylacine tiger that you see in this She's video right here? Opponent. Well, so, the answer is maybe. We do have the technology to extract DNA from museum specimens, from fossils. We have the technology to bring the sequences of genes into other organisms. And you probably heard last week, George Church the famous molecular biologist at Harvard University has now gotten several million dollars to try to bring the mammoth back. Now, this is from the web page of the Mammoth Project. These are supposed to be the 10 core goals of bringing the mammoth back. I circle the ones that I say, okay, I can see where the benefit is. You know, the other ones to me look a little bit 
of a stretch. And I'm being sincere with the mammoth. And some scientists don't think that it's going to be successful. But something for you to think, is it ethical to bring these animals back, especially if they were extinct by human causes? Under what conditions should we bring these extinct species back? So to finalize, I would say that the best way to teach our students about biodiversity is really to take them into the field. And here in, in Glendale College, we're lucky that we can take a students to Baja California. We have a field station next to a UN biodiversity preserve called the Biscaino Preserve and take them to this beautiful, very productive environment called the Gulf of California to different islands where the students on their own explore, you know, uh, kelp beds with endemic species like the Cortez angelfish, the Panamic Cushion uh, star, a 15 foot long zebra worm on the intertidal. They got to islands where so most of the time, they're the only humans in the island. So you take these students that are glued to their cell phones that are in the freeway or in a city all day, and you put them here and they get to see the beauty of biodiversity, the bad of biodiversity, that's an illegally hunted turtle. And they get to swim with one of the most impressive species that are alive today. Whale sharks, largest species of fish ever, in the planet, they get to see the unidirectional flow of water through their mouth, which is used not only for breathing in this animal, but for filtering plankton. They get to see the symbiotic relationships that I talked about. Those fishes attached to the shark are not parasites, they're remoras that basically take a ride with the shark, and they're right next to these animals. And they get to study animals that usually you get to see them in SeaWorld or an oceanarium, but you get to see them in nature. And I really think this is the way that these animals should be seen, not enclosed in a swimming pool. Now you can't, you can't swim with these dolphins, but the students get to observe them close by. If they have a camera, they can put the camera underwater and watch their swimming. So when we talk about concepts like hydrodynamics and swimming strategies, they understand better what we mean by that. If they're lucky enough, like one of the winter programs with Dr. Kretzmann in biology, they got to see a blue whale. It's the largest animal ever on earth. The, the heart is supposed to be about the size of a car, just to give you an impression. They get to swim with animals that are the same species we have here in Southern California. The sea lions, uh, slightly different in terms of genetics, the population in Baja, but these are not afraid of humans. So the minute the students jump into water, they surround them. This is really cool. This is a small humble squid because these guys get to grow six feet long, attacking the camera of a student. They're trying to bite the camera of the student. That is, that's just very cool to me. And then you get to see things that truly look like almost like a, to me, like a BBC special, you know, on nature. Hundreds of monks devil rays that congregate in Baja in the summer for, for mating. They jump out of the water. In other words, it's a striking opportunity for students to learn about biodiversity. And I think that one of the tools that is best positioned for us to teach about the threats of biodiversity and what to do is clearly biodiversity. Now, I want to finish up by saying that this is not me this is a collaborative effort by everybody, by a lot of people. So if this award is not about me, it's about the donors like Kathy and Bill Scripps and Dale Van Dalen and Don Carter, you know, Andra Berstride and the Career Services, the Gauss Grant, the College Foundation, the administration at Glendale College, the classified staff, yes, the, the Baja Field Station staff and the locals in Bahia that welcome our students every time. My friends and faculty and colleagues at in biology, I mean, you guys are the best teachers I know. And uh, I mean, and you maintain a very high standards of rigor in your classes. I do want to honor a friend of my wife and mine that passed away in 2018. Steve Hillenberg was the creator of SpongeBob, and he was a very good friend of my wife and mine. And my wife reminded me the other day, you know, Javier, if still if Steve was alive, he would probably show to your talk to play a joke on you. He usually used to say that he would try to show to our lectures, sit in the back, 
kind of uh, pretending to be a marine biology nerd. And he would push his glasses up and stand up and say, excuse me, I respectfully disagree with what you're saying. Steve is greatly missed. He was one of our best friends, a fantastic, brilliant animator, but a fantastic person that was in direct contact with nature. And last but not least, the most important people in my life. My wife, who's a biologist and a teacher, better than me, Susan. My kids, Michael, who is finishing a degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. And my daughter, Christina, is about to finish her PhD in public health. And I think my brother is, is watching this from the Canary Islands in Spain, my older brother. So I have to be careful what I say here because he probably has some stories of me, about me that he could share. And yes, my, my dog, Tajo, who um, throughout all these year and a half of lectures has fallen asleep most of the time during my lectures. That's it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope this is the last Zoom presentation you have to see for any DFA. And if there are questions, I know I went a little bit past time. I apologize. But if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions that you have. I just also like to ask people to stay on because um, uh, there'll be a short presentation after questions. Hi, Professor, I have a question. I'm listening. That sounds like Jake. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay. uh, I wanted to ask these, these specialized mangroves, um, they're a huge carbon sink, aren't they? They are, right. And that's one, of, that's one of the important things about these ecosystems that mangroves, for example, are capable of removing carbon from the, from the atmosphere and from the water. So a loss of these ecosystems can also contribute right, to the problem of global warming. You are absolutely correct about it. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions? You guys see an octopus in the background? Dr. Kretzman gave me that picture and she sent an email to some of the biology people today saying she's not going to eat octopuses anymore because we're reading more and more about them. And they're supposed to be not only very smart, but absolutely impressive animals. So that's a picture from Baja of an octopus that our students were observing in the tide pools. Um, Dr. Gago, I was going to ask this uh, this trip that you uh, the the students and the professors are taking to Baja. What is the minimum requirement for the classes to take to in order to go? There is no minimum requirement. Most of the classes that we teach in Baja are open to everybody, every student. Most of them are general education classes that don't have prerequisites. I mean, what we want is passionate students that want to experience nature, explore nature as it is. So, you know, we invite everybody, in fact, faculty. I mean, think about the possibilities of teaching and combining courses in literature, you know, that talk about, for example, uh, biophilia or nature and combining it with biology or with something else to go to Baja. It's an impressive place to actually teach and expose the students to, to concepts, you know, in, in biodiversity and nature. Thank you. But, Professor, when gonna be the next time that you think you're gonna take the students to Baja? So we're hoping that this winter we're gonna take a students to Baja. Uh, uh, Greg Meyer, which is one of our young professors, is gonna teach a natural history class in Baja this winter, and then in the summer we plan to teach two more courses. So if things go the right way. We had to cancel them because of the pandemic, but starting next winter, the winter of 2022, we hope to begin to invite students to take classes in Baja. So hopefully that's what we hope to do. Perfect. Thank you. Javier. Dr. Gago, can you oh. hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Yes. This is Armina Hacopian from the board. I'm the board president. And I wanted to congratulate you for your outstanding presentation. I certainly learned a lot and I will share that with the board. So on behalf of the board, Thank you for your presentation and congratulations again. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Okay, um, so thanks for all the, all the questions, everybody. I wanna just stop, do not chat.
please look at Darren Lever's link, which I was just going to paste in there. Um, my own self, but Darren beat me to it. That is a link to a fillable flex form. So I hate to cut to business, but people will want flex credit for uh, attending this lecture. There you go. Copy. I'm going to give you a second to copy that link into your browser, into Microsoft Word. So you have that so you can fill out um, a flex form submission. Okay. And Roger, I, I was going to mention that if, if there's a students that are receiving credit for attending, that's also a link that you want to write your name on. Right. So if we could just leave that pin there. I know we, we love chatting. Let's just let Darren's link sit there so we can. Um, yes, I, I Richard, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I got a text, a little message from Richard. Um, so people can uh, link to the to the flex form. The last piece of business here um, that we need to do is um, Javier, you're, I've got a medal for you here um, with your name on it. Uh, a plaque is on the way, so you'll receive a medal and a plaque uh, commemorating this award. And then also, um, I would like to then um, kick it to Lisa Brooks, um, who will uh, present another aspect of the award uh, to you. I know, Lisa, you're out there. Um, let's, whoops. I'm going to try and spotlight you now, and you can present um, what you have to Javier. So, oh, whoa. Cool. Sorry, sorry, I messed up. I replaced Spotlight. Sorry about that. So, Glendale College Foundation was pleased to present Dr. Gaga with this $1,000 check, but instead of putting it in his bank account, he turned around and donated it to the Baja program. Great thanks, Dr. Gago, and congratulations from the board of Glendale College Foundation. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. I don't know if everyone can convert now to gallery, um, and then Lisa won't be so big on the screen. I'm sorry for my Zoom uh, ineptness. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, attending. We had a probably about 135 people at our peak today. Uh, this is really great. Javier, thanks again for a great lecture. Um, everyone just have a really good rest of your uh, Thursday. And that concludes our, our DFA uh, lecture for uh, fall of 2021. Big hand for Javier. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, and I'm gonna, in case people didn't get that link, I'm gonna post it in the chat one more time and just sit there for a second, try not to chat just so everybody gets that link. And I gave it to Lisa, whoops, not to everybody. Hold on. There we go. Great job, Javier. Great job, Roger. Thanks, Darren. Thank you, Darren. It's a pleasure. Go teach biodiversity. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> you know, it's it's a it's a tough gig watching the world become the oceans become more acidic and people not pay attention to science and mock science. And I have a threads with some of my entertainment professionals where I have to hold my tongue or I don't know. I still try to be friends with them. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't agree more. I try not to say like, uh, come on, come on, man. Don't be a, I just, anyway. But thanks for a great talk. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Hey, Candy, I can see you there. <laughs> okay. All right. So I think I'm gonna. I'm just gonna end this for everybody now. I just want right. to leave that link up there, and um, and then we can. I have Senate Exec now, and if we want to cover it again, or I'm probably fine. But if you want, we can talk about this afterward. I, I think we'll be all right. though. No. thank you. Great job. And I'll, right, I'll take care, guys. I'll, really I'll job. come down to uh, San Pedro. We'll meet for lunch, and I'll give you this uh, medal and, and the plaque when I have it. Thank okay. you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank Javier, you. we'll be having a banquet for you as soon as we possibly can, hopefully in the spring.
Wow. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. Great to see you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.